elementary school together. Uh, we used to play video games at this dude's house, swim in his pool. And uh, I remember, you know, for Bobby, I, I saw him in high school too. From like time to time. I'd see Nan here and there and I uh, didn't go to school a lot but now he's a very <laughs> successful individual so uh, but yeah no grown up since then quite a bit both kind of cross paths with real estate and yeah. uh, things have been good. And then, uh, as we got older I think you know I moved away for a while came back to Sacramento and I found out Bobby's real estate and we got connected that way and over time we closed a bunch of deals together and life is good. So today we're here to talk about real estate, investment properties, how it pertains to you. What did you do before real estate? Sure, yeah, I've been in real estate about five and a half years now. Mm -hmm. I flip properties, I buy investment properties similar to Nan and help people buy and sell uh, traditional sales. Before that I was in insurance and mm -hmm. I was in sales there for about three years. Uh, I realized it's a lot of client management and smaller commissions, so I kind of rolled into um, real estate. Uh, mm -hmm. Another mutual friend, uh, Pete Fong, one of our buddies, he kind of followed his footsteps and got into real estate and kind of took Pete off got from you there. This. Yeah, we were uh, actually sharing so an Pete. office. Uh, I was doing insurance, he was doing real estate, and uh, I just decided to get my license, uh, like I said, five and a half years ago, and I've nice. um, had a pretty good run at it so far. You mentioned that real estate have bigger commissions, insurance have more uh, client management. So w would you say that now the statement is still true that uh, real estate makes bigger commissions, less management? Like, would, do you enjoy this more or are you kind of like, oh, I, sometimes I wish I was. Well, the first it. year was, uh, you know, I think the first year you, you transition into anything, it could be a big hit on your income, your ego, and it's just like, I'm starting mm -hmm. something new. So at this point, five years later, 100% it was the best decision I've ever could have done in my life. I think as you reference that, at times I, I wanted to get into loans, like yeah. doing loans, and I thought maybe that would be another path to do, which is another sure. great profession. But then I think back on all the opportunities being in real estate, I've been able to find for rental properties mm -hmm. and for flips to really create wealth over time. And that's really right. what Nan has done really well on um, over the past six, eight years, however long you've been mm -hmm. investing. And for myself, the past three to five years for investing. A couple of things that you dropped, I don't know if you guys caught that, is like transition. There might be you know, changing your income, changing your status. And the biggest thing that I heard was your ego. Right. You know, for a lot of people that don't know, for someone to start over in something, it takes a lot of determination and, and dedication and you need to be able to drop your ego and start as a student. And I feel like some of the most successful people I know, they have the ability to drop their egos and be a student uh, in an industry that they really want to be in. And I think that's very important. It's, it's very hard to do. And the hardest part to overcome yeah. is fear. Right, we're all scared of giving up our comfort level, whether it's a nine to five, or it's, you know, for myself, I was in sales at a, in, a, in an industry that I had connections with, mm -hmm. but having those connections in insurance transferred over to real estate and allowed me to exploit those and, and turn those into different relationships for people buying and selling and different things like that. Absolutely, it is very tough to switch, but if it's something that you're really passionate about, you'll right. find the right direction and make it happen. Did anybody assist you? Like someone was like, here, I got you, Bobby. Let's do a switch. If you fall, I'm not gonna let you fall on your face. <laughs> or is it where you just like falls out, I'm doing it? Like, um, I'm a pretty go-getter type personality. I have a, a really good drive. So I started yeah. with Chris McPhail. So that was- That's right. Pete got me in the industry, who, wow. who we know. And then Chris McPhail, where you, you know, Matt and your Three property point. manager yeah, is. Yeah. Uh, I started with Chris and that's really how I learned about investment properties, wow. flips and, and buy and holds. He owned a ton of rentals and he flipped properties. So I really um, was under his wing and learning that way. And it really just gradually mm. got, got quite a bit better from there. But yeah, I mean, okay. nobody was handing leads over per se. It was certainly me going out and getting and meeting the right people. So Bobby mentioned Chris. Uh, Chris actually played a role in my life too because my currently current property manager and also the acting broker in the GTC brokerage we partnered with came from Chris too. So he's, a, he's a good guy, very good teacher, I guess. Taught you, taught. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Chris, a uh, successful agent flipper as well. Yeah. He is a teacher and he was a great mm. coach and mentor and was was nice to have that, that one broker guy to pick up the phone, call him, and he always had guidance to help me. Now I'm at Keller Williams, which is a much larger brokerage. Mm. There's 150 agents here, so you have wow. some people that you can learn from and, and ask questions. But mm -hmm. for me, I felt that one-on-one -on -one at the beginning was really important. And I certainly thank him for the opportunity 
uh, when I was with him and, and how much I learned from him. Yeah. Bobby's a realtor. He's also an investor. This is to all the realtors out there, all right? If you consume your own product, if you're a consumer of what you're pitching, I tend to believe you more, okay? Why is that? Because if he invests and is pitching me an investment property, he knows his numbers, right? Our numbers, we may not be looking at the exact same metrics, but I would know that he at least has a very good foundation instead of just pitching me something that he does not know. So if you're a realtor or thinking about becoming a realtor and you're thinking about pitching real estate, uh, investments make sure that you invest yourself as well I think it's really studying your craft so for me yeah. it was really knowing your numbers and investment properties it's uh, buying rentals it's like you know what is your cash flow what is your expenses mm. what are your cap rates what are different things like that Nan has a much simpler way of breaking that down which is kind of nice because you can run those numbers pretty quickly other investors that you may work with <laughs> um, have different metrics yeah so Nan's got like is a uh, one um, percent rule is that what it 1 is? One percent rule. One yeah. percent rule to start. Minimum five percent appreciation, and an upside in the property. So something right. I can do to increase the value dramatically over a short amount of time. Yeah. What was the draw for you to convert from realtor to investor? Like, what was that? I think really ultimately creating a lot of wealth with with sales and everything like that. What I've noticed the last two or three years is that you know we have a good amount of income that comes in. We actually, uh, my wife and I now work together. Uh, we've sold 70 properties this year so far, and we're gonna have a good amount. But you know, corner office, yeah, all right? That's what you up. have your, your gross commissions <laughs> up there, but there's a lot of expenses in real estate. Yeah. So you know, we make you know X amount of dollars a year, which which is solid. But with with flipping homes, um, mm. you're really able to just capitalize on some more wealth. The average flip you can make about thirty thousand mm. dollars. So imagine doing a handful of those, or or more than that. Um, when buying a rental property, I own. Um, I think it's 19 units now, doors. We're able to uh, buy quite a few this year, actually. Uh, we're able to get you know some COVID specials or whatever you want to call them. Yeah. Um, so we're gradually growing that portfolio, but having the option to buy, and I do the, the buy, rehab, and then rent out and refinance. And that's um, it's like created- like a burst strategy, right? The burst strategy. Yeah, yeah. And, and over the, the past three years, that's really taken off. Mm. And I think the last, 16 months we purchased i think 12 units which is a lot for me and really pushing off and and uh, like nan does buying a property doing a 1031 exchange and then going on to that next property so overall i've created more wealth with the investing by far than with my sales mm. so investing you know as, as once again as nan does you're you're appreciating your assets you know rents have been going up in sacramento kind of like a crazy amount mm. and then also um you know, you're paying down on your loan. Nan and I have different strategies. He has higher cash flow, and um, and I kind of look at properties maybe in slightly better neighborhoods. Mm. <laughs> but anyways, um, I'll, you know, I want to keep them for 20 to 30 years, and over time, those are going to be paid off. And when I'm, you know, 50 or 60 at that retirement age, I'm hoping, you know, to have about, you know, 40 or 50 units that are paid off. How many properties did you units did you acquire this year? Uh, well, the past. 14 months, I'd say. Yeah. It was three last year, two in January, five in March, and then we just got another three in contract. Um, five, Good. 10, 12. 12. Yeah. Can you kind of see the exponential factor playing in, like you're buying more and more every single year? It, well, as, as time has is, is grown, I used to yeah. pass off those opportunities and I'd reach mm. out to Nan or other investors and see if they're open to buying these opportunities. And now, um, over the time, since I've created Good Nest Egg, and then I found other investors to partner on different scenarios on how to get the money and the capital to buy those properties. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been keeping them for myself now. Where in the past I was still finding opportunities, but I was selling them to other people. Oh. So Nan does get the secondary options and I'll get the first options. We still so do now I know. a couple deals a year together. I've been knowing this. But, uh, <laughs> so these realtor <laughs> investors, okay, get the best deals. You gotta go for the first. You gotta go for the first shot. Um, it's just finding the right deal though. You know, you can't force anything. You just kind of got to right. let it come to you and make sure you're, you're making uh, smart choices. Sure. And uh, earlier, Bob, you mentioned there's different class of real estate you can buy. All right. Correct me if I'm wrong. And my views are, you know, there's class A, class B and class C. OK, A's are like your Beverly Hills type properties. Uh, B's are, you know, the general really nice properties where you see consistent cash flow. And then C class properties are probably your most troublesome properties in the worst neighborhoods, all right? And 
how I view it is that the B class properties are less troublesome, more consistent, but there's less opportunity in the sense that you can just dramatically increase the value uh, by a huge margin compared to the C. And then, you know, it's very interesting that I don't personally deal with these properties, but I had to, I would never buy in some of these neighborhoods because sometimes I think, I think I might get shot, you know, <laughs> like that's how bad some of these properties are. But however, you know, I went to one of his properties on Friday. I thought I was going to get shot. <laughs> <laughs> hey, remember that there was a uh, chance. <laughs> you know what? You showed me Mendocino. Do you remember that? And yeah. you sold me Mendocino. It was Mendocino right? and Sierra Vista. Uh, Oh, no, it was, it was Sierra, Sierra Vista. Vista. Oh. Yeah. Okay, I gotta, tell you, guys. I gotta tell you guys. First time we story, saw okay? it. <laughs> We've been watching this property for like a year and a half now, right? The first time Bobby showed us, showed me this property, when we walked on the property, there <laughs> were, I'm not, I'm not using these derogatory terms as derogatory terms. I'm using them to depict what exactly happened. Okay. There were pimps and hoes that came out of the back unit. <laughs> Literally <laughs> pimps and hoes. I think two pimps and three hoes. Okay. And then as we were on the properties, more hoes and pimps came by and was like, what was happening here? Why, why is this white guy and this Asian dude on our property? And then we walked into the main house. I remember the front door was locked, right? And you had to find the key to go to a side door. And Bobby being Asian, I'm like, I'm not going in there first. Bobby, you take the lead. And I can see him taking a deep breath. And he opens the door and the first thing he does, this guy, no, we walked in and you jumped, right? We, there was a giant teddy bear on the ground, <laughs> which I thought it was like a person or it could have been a dead body. I was like, oh shoot. Yeah. But it was, I had a, it was harmless. But. I had a handyman crew there too, right? And they were like, yeah. what the? Like all of them jumped because us two jumped and then they looked over and they were thinking the same thing we were thinking that there was a dead person on the ground, but it was just- So some work. properties, it's nice to go in with about five people so, <laughs> <laughs> rather than rolling in there by yourself, which That's can be funny. a little sketchy. So some of these neighborhoods, as you said, the C's and there's even D's, um, you know, they're, they're that lower grade for a reason. There's certainly some more uh, sketchy issues that you may have to come across and deal with. There's a lot more work for you to do. There's more issues. They're just uh, more just risk, more extreme reward. hassle, probably a little more reward as well. But talking about uh, Sierra Vista, right? So I think I bought that, how much? 255? Yeah, about that. We were, man, we were negotiating that one for about a year. So. Yeah, so I think we got it for 255, completely renovating back unit. I think I'll be able to sell it for like 370, something like that. At least uh, I'll walk away with 100K on that property even though we had to, you know, put our lives at risk. A couple Bobby times. Pe Peterson, <laughs> yeah, he'll do that to you. But you know, if he does that to you, just make him go first. That's the key, if he gets shot. High risk, high reward <laughs> at the end of the day, right? That's funny. Like, what would you say to a person who's thinking about getting into investment? You know, I'm big on kind of passing on my knowledge. I'm big on just sharing at least some basic information to help people make that transition because I feel like nobody should be poor. Tell me if you agree with this or not. If you're born at a certain place at a certain time that is not America, and let's just say you're born in a third world country that is, you know, the war is raging and you're born in a very poor family, there's very little that you can do to kind of climb out of your socioeconomic status, right? Uh, even in America, if you're born in a very, uh, you know, low, in a low income neighborhood to parents who doesn't quite care about you and you don't have a good education. It's very difficult for someone to get out of that situation. And so I really just want to provide a foundation or just a voice of reason for people who want to get out of that situation, who's working at McDonald's, uh, you know, full-time job and have another part-time job just to make ends meet. And I want them to know that, you know, investment is a thing. You can get into investment with very little down. You're talking about like 3.5 to 5% down. You have to build your credit though. You have to have uh, consistent income history though. Like, what would you just say to somebody like that who's thinking about like, okay, like how do I become wealthy? You know, I'm working, I'm slaving away. My parents don't have money. Like how do I become <clears throat> wealthy is real estate right. a yeah. vehicle. Great, great point there. So I feel real estate yeah. can create more wealth than most other industries, maybe besides tech and oil and some of those other places as far as like startup, mm -hmm. but buying a house right now, you can buy a house with almost zero down, gradually Crazy. build wealth over time with down payment assistance programs, right? The other big one, I use this twice, but it's called mm -hmm. your FHA owner occupied. Yeah. Now you can buy a multi-unit property with, as you said, three and a half percent down. Yeah. You can live on one side and Correct. rent out the other with rents are 1500. Um, aside these days for a two bedroom, one bath, if you buy that property for yeah. 350 or 400,000, 
you could have your living expenses at a thousand dollars a month mm -hmm. and rent out the other side for 1500 you could do that for six to 12 months and go buy another one now if you're someone that um you state worker making forty to sixty thousand dollars a year, and you're you're working yeah. up over time, and you're building that pension, and that's what you're looking at retirement. Mm -hmm. If you were to buy a multifamily property this way and have it paid off in thirty years, you could have five hundred thousand or six hundred thousand dollars at the end of that time of net equity. Right, that's just one property. That's one property. One if you property. go do that same scenario and buy it twice. Yeah. You're talking about a million dollars. And for people in that 40 to $60,000 a year, mm -hmm. there's not really a lot of other opportunities that you can create that type of wealth for retirement. So, you know, getting in real estate, whether it's on a low level and something like that, or you start mm -hmm. doing it and then you're like, man, I, I can make a living out of this. And you start rolling into other properties. That is how I started. And I did two properties with the FHA owner occupied and yes. kind of built from there. So there's a ton of opportunities. Um, wholesaling's one, um, hmm. and then also, if you find the deal, you can find the money at the end of the day. You find sure. a good deal, you never know who, who you may be in your network that has a good opportunity as an investment property. Yeah. I guarantee if you call Nan or myself and you had a deal and you try to work out some type of partnership Money's or a wholesale price. fee or whatever it is, you yeah. will make some money on that. So um, there's a lot of different opportunities. Bigger Pockets is one of the sites for investing that you Pretty should good, definitely yeah. check out for a lot of different blog information and following right. Nan's information as well. And to expand on what you were saying, right? The FHA, you can buy duplex, triplex, or fourplex yep. with the FHA. VA as well. You can do VA. FHA, almost zero down. VA, I mean like even conventional at 5% down, that's still very low compared to investors having to put in 20 or 30%. Right. You put down 3.55%, you get into, you occupy one unit and then you rent out the other one, two or three units, have them subsidize your rent. Two years later, you can move out, get into your next property. You can do this every two years, save enough money. We're talking about enough money. We're talking about like- It's actually every 12 months. You can do it every 12 months. It's every 12 months. Yeah. That you only oh, that you need to live in. Technically, okay, you need gotcha. to live in the property for 12 months and then you can yeah. go buy something else. You could sell after two years without incurring capital gains. Correct, yeah. Uh, so after 12 months, you could get into another property with the FHA loan. You can do this every 12, can you imagine that doing it every 12 months? You, someone with a $40,000 income can be rich beyond their dreams if they're just disciplined enough to learn and invest and just learn some of the basic information, right? You know where people mess up? Uh, they invest their money and they lose their money. And you know, let's just say someone who earns $40,000 a year, saves enough money, uh, invest in uh, something that's one of their friends told them to invest in, loses all their money and they'll never do it again, right? And then they become one of those people that's like, don't invest, save your money, that's a no-go, right? Yeah, I think at the end of the day, it's like, it's being a student of what you're interested in and really sure. studying the market, talking with good realtors that are in investing. Yeah. Like as Nan said at the beginning, like I do a lot of investing, so I'm well aware of what these properties look like. Yeah. There's a ton of other realtors that are specialties in investment properties as well, but there's a ton of property. Like I said, I'm with 150 agents here, something like that. Mm -hmm. Majority of them come to me with questions on multifamily properties and flips and different things like that. So, nice. you know, people have different specialties when you're in that, that real estate market and, and focusing and working with the right folks is important. And, you know, be careful what you invest your time into. It's very important that you make that distinction. Okay. Again, not bagging on anybody, but selling shoes versus selling house. Okay. You hold on to your shoes. How much does your shoes appreciate? You hold on to a house. Okay. You got into a house. Let's just say, you know, $500,000 home. Let's just say you got into a 5% down. That's $25,000 down. Every year that you're holding that property is appreciating on the leverage value of $500,000, right? So this is appreciating $25,000 a year just by you holding that property. I mean, how much you buy $25,000 of shoes, if you hold it, how much would, you, would it appreciate? Is it compounding appreciation over time? Right. Right. That's a big thing, compounding appreciation. The $500,000 appreciate 5% this year, 25,000. But next year, it's not only is it appreciating on the $500,000, it's also appreciating on the $25,000 that has gained the previous year. Yeah, so. you got cash on cash return and then mm -hmm. really the appreciation that he's talking about. Right. You're talking about that $25,000, four to six to eight to 10 years later, that minimal investment is gonna get you to 100,000, 150,000 over yeah, time. So it's, crazy. It's, it's 
pretty remarkable. As he said, the compound effect, if you're holding these properties for a period of time, hmm. it's gonna create wealth. And then the average over, I think a 30 year span, it's about three to 4% annually on appreciation. Obviously that's counting the big dips in uh, 09 and 2010. <clears throat> and we've been on this hmm. great stretch for quite some time. And right now what we're really seeing is a supply and demand issue. Hmm. And it's really, you know, shooting things up a bit more with appreciation, so. Oh, so since this is a good segue, what, what are your thoughts on current market conditions based on COVID? How do you view the current market conditions? Uh, real sure, quick? and you get, you get two different perspectives there yeah. as we're talking about uh, you know, properties that we live in and stuff like you know, single family homes versus multifamily homes. So starting with the, the single family homes, the big thing this year, once again, is supply and demand. The stat I saw a few weeks ago was that we had 2,500 homes that didn't go on the market this year that went on the market last year. So we have that many less listings available for people to choose from to buy. So obviously there's a shortage there because people are either scared to sell, they don't want people in their houses, a bunch of different reasons that, that's causing that shortage. Interest rates are the best that they've ever been yeah. at this point. Super low. Getting quotes at 2.8% yeah. to purchase mm. a house and sometimes lower, Crazy. it all depends on your credit. Multi-family homes at 3.3, which is ridiculously mm. low for multi Insane. You're always gonna pay more for two units, three, four, than it yeah. for one unit, your primary residence. So all that is really causing a, uh, a very competitive market where there's a lot of offers on homes because there's more buyers than sellers right now. Yeah. When we shoot over to the, the multi-family properties, um, Nam probably has more insight on people paying rents and things like that. But obviously we have some stricter tenant restrictions that came in, uh, in California specifically about the moratorium, about evictions and paying rent. So that's having a big impact. Very blessed and fortunate. I think I said I got 16, 19, we're in escrow on three, but mm -hmm. 16 right now. And uh, everybody is paid. Everybody's miss, still paying rent? I haven't missed one payment. And that, that could wow, go into good. the different classes yeah. of, of uh, properties that you own. Mm -hmm. And I talked with his uh, property manager and obviously you have uh, um, people relying on government assistance, which I, mm -hmm. some of your properties are. Eight, yeah. And they're, they're certainly paying because they're getting assistance. Mm -hmm. Then you have that middle tier group. And then, so there's different tiers. And fortunately, a lot of my um, tenants, state workers, uh, nurses, medical field, different things like that haven't been affected. Um, but anyways, the, the multifamilies have been going up as well because you got yeah. less supply and you got more demand. So I sell a lot of multifamily homes as well, hmm. probably about 10 to 14 a year, either buying or helping buy and sell. And um, talking with the sellers, you know, they're worried about their tenants. You know, if, if, mm. we, if we're bringing buyers in there and they were to get COVID or something, they could be liable. So that certainly played an impact on the market there as well. But as we put our crystal ball in front of us and what's mm -hmm. going on in the future, there are a lot of people that are putting their payments off for forbearance, which is mm. not paying your mortgage and not paying your rent. It's gonna be very interesting to see what happens come February, March, April. It yeah. hasn't really affected us at all yet. Um, I do know there's a ton of people moving here from the Bay Area as well. There's a lot of people switching mm. their living circumstances where they're yeah. in an apartment, they want more space if we were to get sheltered in place again. Um, they want a bigger backyard. Mm. COVID has really set that mindset of how do I want to live and what do I want to do in, mm. in that new living environment. And um, it's really created a, a lot of people looking to move. I don't know what's gonna happen. It's gonna be very interesting. I feel the demand is really high though. And we'll see if that offsets some of these potential bankruptcies that could be out in the future. Do you feel that after the elections, let's just say the subsidies stop, forbearance comes to fruition, now people have to pay the mortgage that they didn't pay. I mean, the interest rate is gonna be low for a while. Like, what are your thoughts? Do you feel that that might have an impact on potential foreclosures and Defaults. <clears throat> I think defaults for sure. I yeah. don't think too many foreclosures just because there's been a lot of equity in a lot of these people's mm -hmm. homes. So they, you know, they have room to sell that house and make it a more sure. traditional sale. There are going to be a lot of bankruptcies for sure. As far as when the election and, and things like that, the forbearance thing is certainly the big one. And a lot of these banks, they don't want to foreclose on these homeowners. They don't because it doesn't help mm -hmm. them out. They, I, they're gonna wanna do a loan modification and push these payments out and tack another year and a half on it and try to make it work. Yeah. You know, the crystal ball is up in the air and we don't know exactly what's gonna happen. Uh, it's gonna be interesting for sure. When you're investing in property, just play a good defense. I will say, you know, don't go into it with a single exit strategy, you know, go into it with multiple exit strategies. 
Uh, if your main focus is to flip but make sure that you have the ability to hold this property for a long time if needed, uh, I think that's probably the best of both worlds where, okay, you play a very aggressive offense, but at the same time play pretty good defense if needed. And, you know, COVID, I think overall, just really sped up the process for everything. I mean, everything. The business I was going to go out of business, went out of business. The business I was here to stay, they're going to be here to stay. Some real estate investors who played, you know, not very good defense, they're going to get hurt. I think it just sped up everything just over, over time. Uh, anyways, looking at yourself now, and you're thinking about your future. Where is uh, Bobby Peterson going to be five years down the line? Like, where do you see yourself? Like, what kind of properties are you holding? What are you currently doing? What are you doing then? Are you still a realtor? Like, do you have your own brokerage now? Like, what is your, what is that <clears throat> forecast like? Yeah, so I got, I got married uh, about a year ago and I'm at Keller Williams and uh, she yeah. is not willing to ever leave this spot. She's been here 10 years, so oh, wow. I'll certainly stick with Keller Williams. You know, this year I've, mm -hmm. I've been very fortunate and I, uh, I bought 13 properties this year. 10 were flips and we held mm -hmm. three and we got a few in contract right now. So continue to do the flips, certainly buy more properties. I'm looking to add about, you know, maybe 10 units a year is really what the goal is. I've been looking some out of state. I haven't pulled the trigger on anything like that yet. I just bought uh, five units outside of Sacramento County, which was in Marysville. I got a pretty good deal mm. on in uh, March and April. And um, just continue the path that we that I've been going on. It's mm -hmm. been a, a, a blessed last couple years. And uh, certainly once again, uh, you know, if you guys ever thought about getting into real estate, certainly can reach out to myself or Nan. And there's a lot of good ways to create wealth in this industry. I would say, you know, in terms of five years as he referenced that again i think it's bill gates that kind of had a good quote it said overestimate what you can do in one year and underestimate five years i had no Over. idea where i would be here today yeah. where i am five years ago I, I don't know if nan's in the same boat but it's been um it's been a, a good ride for for the market and, and real estate in a whole having a baby too soon having a ba baby i got a uh, seven weeks to go yeah. uh my wife with 33 weeks pregnant wow. so we're very excited about that and that's gonna change the dynamic of of business and probably take a, a little time off but uh yeah. i have a hard time you know slowing my mind down and not working mm. um but it'll be interesting time for sure this is a good topic i don't think that's bad like do you work all the time uh, six days a week, probably seven, but you know, okay. sometimes on the weekends it's checking out a flip or one of yeah. listing appointment or kind of something subtle, but certainly, uh, even on vacations, you know, the phone's ringing mm -hmm. all the time. So we're really trying to, uh, my wife and I, we have an assistant really trying to build systems to make sure that we work a little less. And that's where the rental properties come in. You know, really, I think rental properties is all about replacing your income, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever you do right now, if you're making 50 or 60,000 a year, how do I build up rental properties to replace that? If you're making 100 or 150, how do you build up rental properties to replace that? Yeah. So the long-term goal is you say five to 10 years, replacing the income on the traditional day-to-day -day sales so I can have a little more time for my family. I think I think that's what it's all about and that's why Nan loves investing in real estate. I think, you know, when you're younger, so what if you're working seven days a week? Right. You know, and, and I feel like if you're younger, you should. Uh, don't bitch about not having weekends. Fuck your weekends right now. You know, like all the people. No, seriously, grind, like grind, grind. Dude, all the people that complain in their twenties, like I don't want to work on weekends. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. I'm like, I can spot it. You're gonna be one of those broke people, <laughs> right? But if you're willing to sacrifice some weekends, some you know after work hours to build your future, you probably very well likely be very successful in the future. You know, even now uh, you work six, seven days a week. I work seven days a week. It's not like I'm working nine to five, seven days a week. Right, right. I'm probably clocking two hours a day, seven days a week. This is working right now. This is my two hours today. I'm flying back to LA afterwards. But like the point is like consistency. I work all the time, but I enjoy what I do. Even though this is work, it doesn't feel like work right now. Does that make sense? I'm, I'm having a conversation with the old friend. I'm getting his two cents, you know, in and about real estate. Um, I'm, I'm talking about his future, what he's going to do. We're talking about some of the things that he has done. Like we're just having a conversation. But the people that have that are just so, super focused on, I'm only gonna work nine to five, that's the only thing I'm going to do. They're the type of people that I expect to get paid for more than what they do. And oftentimes those people don't end up very at very good places. And if you invest wisely in the future, you know, I'm sure you'd be able to replace your income in no time. It's just a matter of, you know, how many units do I need to buy to replace the income. Oh, one of the best things I like about real estate, we can continue to scale and increase our income with the same amount of effort or less. What do I mean by that? Uh, let's just say you have 10 units, 
right? And it takes you a year to buy two units, okay? Next year, let's just say it took you a year to buy two units, now you have 12. Next year, it might only take you 11 months and 10 days to buy two more units because you have 12 units behind you. And once you get the two more, now you have 14. Next year, it might only take you 10 months. And the year after that, it might only take you 11 months. And you, you keep on building this huge <clears throat> nest egg that's paying you more and more. Your equity is being paid down by renters. You're getting tax benefits from depreciation and tax write-offs, right? You're getting cash flow from the rental properties. And then there's appreciation on the property. And then there's opportunity for you to flip and dramatically increase the value. There's so many things that you could do to increase your net worth with, relatively speaking, minimal efforts. I don't have to be there nine to five to make $100,000. I make $100,000 with a flip. Sierra Vista, thank you. After a year, after a year and like three months or something like that, lock this property down. How do you start doing this? It's mm. networking. It's networking, networking, networking. Nan networks with a lot of realtors. I network with realtors, attorneys, bankruptcy, probate, divorce, mm. um, off market properties are the key to getting wealth in real estate. Your network is gonna be your net worth at the end of the day, so. Very much so. Totally agree the with properties that. are being leveraged when you're not working and they're getting paid off when you're yeah. sleeping and over time, so. Yeah, and if you wanna be a good investor, you better have with a, a dream team, right? In every category, every profession you're talking, you know, for Bobby, he just brought me so many off-market listings. Uh, I pass on some, I bought some, but you have to have, you know, Bobby's in your world. You, got, you have to have attorneys in your corner. You have to have good property managers, good handyman, good contractors, right? But yep. that all takes time to build. Uh, I would suggest, highly suggest, that if you're thinking about getting real estate, uh, definitely do so. It will change your world. You know, without real estate, I, I tell everybody openly, without real estate backing me up, I probably would have gone bankrupt a couple of times. It's not completely my fault. I have been screwed by business partners who are not, who didn't have the best morals. But the point is, if I didn't have real estate as a solid foundation, as this thing is backing me up all the time, I don't know where my life will be. So that's why I'm such an advocate for investing in real estate. And I believe that you guys could do it. If you guys need assistance, definitely hit up Bobby, hit up myself. We're more than open to answering your questions and we'll leave you all of his uh, social media and contact information below so you can hit him up. Uh, you wanna leave off with any words, to the, words of wisdom for the well, audience? I appreciate your time. And uh, yeah. I think like he said, give me a call if you guys have any questions or email or anything like that. Certainly uh, open to sharing information on things that I've learned over time. Thanks guys. Thank you.